Good afternoon, everyone. Cuba, get and grow your own or starve. This links right into allowing you into a supermarket or first started by airlines to allow you onto planes. The CCI, immunity passports. We see it in China. She has a green check. She's good to enter a supermarket. Clear in the U.S. Kobe Pass in the U.S. Immunity Pass, $89 per month. I wonder what politicians are involved with the private companies that are going to be raking this in by the billions per month because there's already bills to pass microchip privacy laws and Australian politicians, they don't care about facts. You either get the Kobe Pass or you don't enter stores or partake in everyday life ever again. Who's going to profit from this most? A sign of the future here. Cuba is where we need to look. Havana tells its citizens to grow your own food because their imports are being cut off or they're going to starve. There's no second choice. Grow it or there's nothing. Havana's asking residents to grow wherever they can. And this is real interesting. So if there's disused lots or on tops of roofs that you see there for buildings, every square inch is going to be utilized for a garden. And with that, I started to look at other preparedness sites here for home gardening news. Garden know-how. The link's here for you. And once you read through these sites, you're going to have a plethora of information to help you get more prepped out. Now, how does this intersect with your daily life and entering a supermarket or any store, for that matter of fact, controlled by a Fortune 5 so you can continue with your daily life? Well, you knew it was going to start here. The airlines, they want you to have something called an immunity passport because you're going to be packed together on a plane and they want to make sure if anybody's sick, they can trace you down as soon as you get to the next country and pass that information, privacy, over to other governments, unquestioned. I'm not a fan, but we see also politicians in Australia calling for the exact same thing. You get these tests or you can't get on the airplane. You get these tests or you can't participate in everyday life. Raf Kikone, labor senator, we cannot even afford to give an inch of any ground to anybody who chooses not to participate. And an app on the phone or a jab in the arm, both okay. And remember, this person is not interested in any alternative facts. So if other new information comes out, they don't want to hear it. Particularly this person who penned their own article in The Age says, don't even give me facts, don't care. And I link that below. That is the, one of the most interesting reads you're going to see on how politicians who are benefiting are going to push this to no end. You really might want to read that article in The Age. And here's where it gets interesting. These passes so far, the first one I could find with a dollar amount is Immuni Pass. You sign up for this thing, you go to your doctor, you get tested, you send in your results, and then you get into a database there and you see the barcode or the QR code. Every time you go somewhere, they're going to scan this. $89.95 per month, not for a year, a month. And then reading a little further into this thing, it's set up as you as the individual to get the scanning ability when you enter stores and whatnot, but at the same time, it gives this information to anybody who is a registered, I guess, physician or something in the medical profession to be able to oversee you and your medical records through this scan card. Now, who has access to that database? Looks nice and innocent on the front there, but behind that, who's getting all your data? And this is coming in different flavors and shapes. So Immunity Pass has its own set of standards. Covey Pass, which you look at, has its own set of standards. The apps in China have their own standards. But Immunity Pass is just, is it in your blood? Have you been exposed to it? Yes or no? And they'll show you. And if you have, then you should be less likely to get it. Okay, that's the Immunity Pass. In China, it's all about having the temperatures taken and registering in their system as well. So she has a little green check. She can go anywhere she wants. If it's a different color, they stop her from boarding trains, subways, or any kind of public transport. Clear is a little bit different with the QR code and Kobe Pass also a little bit different. It's a monthly fee, but this one will not be like Immunity Pass where you, you have it in your blood, you've been exposed to it or whatever. It's just you take it in the beginning of the month to test. It's green for the first week and a half, and then it changes color to yellow or orange. And then at the end of the month, those last few days, it color changes down until it's red. And when it's red, you can't go in any store, and then you have to get a new test and a new pass. So my natural question is, what politicians are involved with which private companies that are going to be pushing this? You know, over in Australia, you already see people that are not even going to listen to alternative facts. It's all about the money down there. And who's going to be paying for all this? Is my health insurance going to pay for it? $89 a month? Is that covered? Is that out of pocket for me? That's a thousand US dollars a year times billions of people. 
That's trillions of dollars over how many years do you think into some certain subset of companies that are running this here? And what if you have to double test per month? Something like this. So I was digging in a little further here, which I'm going to do a much longer video on this. IBM, Oracle, Hasera are developing and working with private individuals and corporations. 69 Fortune 5s have already signed up for this thing called the COVID Credentials Initiative, CCI. And they're going to develop these immunity passports. And whether you like it or not, you're going to have to get it or you're not going into a store ever again. The CCI so far, 300 individuals from 100 organizations, meaning Fortune 5s, looking to deploy and help deploy this verifiable credential project. This is where the whole blockchain goes into there, where they're supposed to have anonymity built into the blockchain and whatnot. And where we take a step into the bazaar is Michigan in the United States passing bills now to protect privacy of those that are microchipped. Voluntary, though, first here in the beginning where they say could not mandate employees to do it for a Fortune 500 company to go through the office to do the door swipe, etc. Have all your COVID information in this chip? Not yet. Because if you read a little further in the article in the italics, which was really interesting, it reads, I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes a standard business practice statewide within the next few years. Predictive programming. This intersection of chips, passes, blockchain identity and you stuck in the middle having pay for it all ran into this article mastercard joins blockchain digital identity alliance i didn't know what the trust over ip foundation was but it includes accenture evernim ibm r3 that's private blockchain out of singapore but we're all familiar with id 2020 to provide a digital identity for everyone now this is somehow lumped into the covid credentials initiative to develop immunity passport you're going to have to pay for this monthly or quarterly. At least some prices are coming out between $20 and $90. This was first pushed by the airlines, electronic travel authorization, to make sure you wouldn't infect anybody on the plane. COVID Credentials Initiative. Deploy privacy-preserving verifiable credentials. This is where it gets deep and strange. Now 60 Fortune 500 companies formed their own self-sovereign identity groups to make sure that we all get these immunity passports. At least that's a surface layer, because when we get into the universal registrar, otherwise known as a decentralized identifier, it goes deep and it keeps rewinding to the same companies again and again, from the finance to the operating systems. And the things standing in the way right now are these interoperable overlays, because it's all about getting you registered on this thing and somebody else to oversee you as a guardian. This is where we tumble down the rabbit hole. Individual organizations willing to take legal responsibility for managing the agent wallet on behalf of the person under guardianship, meaning you're owned by somebody in the corporate world. Self-sovereign identities, decentralized identity, overseen by sovereign, the identity for all counsel, I4A. And the guardianship means you're an owned piece of property. They're going to digitize individuals, organizations, natural things and man-made things. You want to touch any of that? You're going to have to be using V code. And to give you an idea of the money and backing behind this, these are just the players in Singapore that are bringing this to life. Australian politicians say you won't be able to partake in any type of everyday life if you don't get this COVID passport. RFID chips are not mandatory for now but you shall not buy, sell, or trade without this mark. So the purpose of this video is to try to blend two different technologies with the cryptocurrency and the, and the decentralized blockchain and the switch of money during this COVID crisis. As you can see across the predictive programming media, looks like lockdown 2.0 is going to be inbound. And when that happens and the economy locks up across the planet, there's definitely going to be a shift into something different. So... I've been looking at a DeFi, which is decentralized finance, knowing that cryptocurrency is also going to have a rise during this run to the dollar and shake up of the economy and everything financial. And if you remember 2017 with all the ICOs in the run up, it looked very much like this where it was flat. I got a couple bumps and then off to the moon. And I was really interested in the way Visa was sort of moving in the direction of doing digital asset service plans. Now, this was a way to get digital signatures and cross-platform identity services where they were trusted, quote-unquote. 
And this could have been done on the blockchain with a certain set of protocols in order to be able to unlock or transfer funds. It wasn't like a multi-signature wallet, something completely different. And I'm really interested in the way that this technology is moving forward because I think it's going to be part of our world. And it seems to be taking a nefarious turn where things that were supposed to be freeing humanity are now going to be used to put it in chains. So what we have in the first part of the video here talking about the COVID passport, that's now literally now happening. They're gonna want you to get the test to be verified to move on public transport. What's coming in the beginning of 2021 is the last part of the video. And these two are blending into expediency or the next lockdown 2.0 is gonna usher in the rest of this tech that you are gonna be required to adhere to whether you like it or not. You're gonna be owned by a company. So looking into the giant payment systems here, MasterCard joining the Blockchain Digital Identity Alliance, ID2020. Now this is a protocol that's put out by Gates and enormous amount of others that are going to require digital identity. This is the whole thing about getting the star on your driver's license if you're in the United States. You know how they're not gonna let you board a plane unless you have this? It's to try to funnel you into this system because unless you're gonna wanna not travel ever again, you're gonna have to get this. So I went to the ID2020 website to try to dig out a little more information. And obviously it's very general, very generic. It just says provide a digital ID to everyone. It doesn't sound that nefarious until you understand what that means about tracking you. But another thing, the way the ID2020, I thought it was maybe a spacing issue in my computer, but then as I tried another device and notice the ID2020, how the two is chopped off. So for me, that was a signal to maybe invert it and mirror it. So I did a couple combinations here, and then if you double it again, you get this IB8 with some strange symbol in the middle, which I still am trying to look up. I haven't found it yet, but then you get the 8 reverse BI. So if you know anything about the symbolism here, please put it in the description box below so we can share information. And then beyond the catchy headlines, which most people don't go after, if you read further into it, you're going to see this ID2020 alliance is basically started by Microsoft. And then it mixes in all these biometric technologies and digital identities but then there has to be a storehouse or the technology behind it to run it all. It's not just blockchain, that's its own thing, but then there has to be an interface between that and companies holding onto this information. And that's where we get into Accenture, IBM, Oracle, and the whole gamut of tech companies. And it does seem at the end of this is gonna be a global ID system, not country centric. Now the way to soft trickle this thing in here is your immunity passport. This is pushed by the airlines. So if you fly for business, you're definitely going to have to get it. If you're involved in the travel industry, you must get it or else you will lose your job. So it's a way for the soft drip feed disclosure into this. Immunity passport, airlines are calling for it, digital ID tracking system. So if you want to ever travel again and get on an airplane, they're going to make you go to your doctor and get a test. And before you can get on the airplane, you'll have to enter their credentials into some system weeks before or a week before you travel and this will be on a central database and then the airlines will have access to it. Now I don't know how much access they have to your medical records but they'll have an access to see a positive negative reading and that's where it begins. And here's where we tumble down the rabbit hole because 60 Fortune 500 companies right now are creating something called the Self-Sovereign Identity Group. And what they're going to do is focus all their efforts into creating these immunity passports which are going to be required for you to get on a subway or get into a taxi or take an Uber or if you want to book an Airbnb in the future, you're going to be required to do this. And as I've heard, somebody said that even to enter a grocery store in the future, you'll have to show this that you're tested negative so you don't contaminate the cans on the shelves or something. So taking a look here at Ledger Insights, deeper dive into the article, these immunity passports. And the whole group spearheading this is called COVID Credentials Initiative, CCI. You'll start hearing about them later on in the year. September, October, this is going to suddenly pop out of the woodwork here. And again, you're going to start seeing these same names repeating, rinse and repeat. It's as if they create new groups, rinse and repeat, and they start another one, but they're the base for the monetary resources into the, the whole gamut. There's all these 25, 30 companies set up, but it's all the same companies that reset up different companies to make it an illusion that it's a tiny little initiative with just a few people sitting at a desk trying to push this because they love humanity. But it's always Microsoft, Consensus, IBM, Oracle, all the big payment processors and... It's all about aggregating data, storing your data, and having access to your data. Medical data, which I personally am not down with. If an airline can pull your medical records, yeah. 
So go over to the COVID-19 Credentials Initiative site. I've linked everything in the description box below. So as we go through this, you can chase down any of the leads you want. I am doing a very brief surface view of this, deploying privacy preserving verifiable credential projects. So you can't verify your identity anymore with the government. It can only be through these private companies that are gonna tell you how you have to verify and how you have to pay for this every time you wanna verify. And see, when I first started looking into it, it was 60 organizations and then 100 and now it's more than 200. So a perfect example of this being deployed right now is in China, where you see the girl there, she has her phone turned toward you. It has a green mark on it, which means she's allowed to travel freely, get on a subway, bus, whatever, go into stores, if that's red, they won't let her on anything publicly. So I was wondering, you know, how much is this going to cost? Are all these companies going to eat the cost and just do it for free because they love humanity? Of course not. Now, this is going to be forced by law in the future. The Immunity Pass card or the Immunity Pass Digital itself, the physical card's 20 bucks, and the, uh, I guess the digital app that goes along with it is $80. So... Since most American media is talking about being tested monthly, you can look at this as having a $90 monthly test to prove that you're not infected wherever you go. You get the card with it. It's a nice looking card, but see those barcodes and the QR code on there? This is where it gets a little bizarre because anybody can check on you. Anybody who has access to this data system here, all they have to do is either scan either of those and then boom, your identity is going to come up and everything about your medical history associated with the COVID inside this thing. Plus, they're going to know your name, your address, your identity, your birth date, the height, and all these things about you biometrically. Now, it's anybody who has access to the system, and that's going to be millions and millions and millions of people. So nothing could go wrong with that, I'm sure. So how it seems to work so far here is you're going to get a color code assigned to your immunity pass based on the test results that you have to go to your doctor yourself and get. And then you put it into immunity pass and they enter their credentials for you, whatever the scan code was off of your medical results. White is not tested. So this is interesting. Why would they have a code for no test unless they're going to give this to everybody as an ID? And then wherever you go, if it's white or you didn't get tested, you're not allowed in. Why would there be a no test? Obviously, if you have it, you had some test, unless they're going to give it like driver's licenses, passports, or with social security numbers, whatever, and it's going to color code you with what you are. Red, you're positive. Then you're going to have to take additional tests and additional tests and additional tests until you can prove some sort of antibodies. And then yellow will be some sort of presumed immunity. And then green will finally turn over from the red after you've had umpteen tests to prove something. And Immunity Pass is not the only one out there. And I did a previous video on this talking about just the one aspect of entering a supermarket that's going to be required beyond the mask wearing and all that. You're going to have to show this as green before they're going to let you into a store where if you're getting stimulus money, at least in the United States, that'll be deposited into your digital wallet with the new Fed coin. You're going to be required to take this in at the point of purchase. No green, no entry. And everybody's going to have to have this on their phones or else you're not going to be able to go in anywhere. Buy, sell, trade, or transact. Now, Kobe Pass is another one. So there's three already rolled out. And these are multi-billion dollar companies rolling these platforms out to get you tested and into the system. Now, the ultimate goal of this, after reading a few white papers, which I'll present in just a second here, is V-Code. It's going to be the one code the infinite possibility, and I love how they put event tickets. Like, really, getting my full digital identity and medical records onto a code system on an app on a computer or a card that's QR code or barcode swipeable. It's all about travel tickets and event tickets. Sure it is. It's all about control over you. And with the CCI here, you're the holder or the provider. But somewhere in the middle, you get claimed by a company with the verifier, which is the technology protocol to show if it's green, red, white, blue, purple, whatever, and the issuer, which is the one that's going to be giving you the credentials. So who put those two in charge of saying, oh, now you have to go through my protocol because I just made it up and I'm going to mandate through the Congress people that we bought off that you take this and, and you're in part of it now. It's pretty much what just happened. Like I said, most people skim headlines, but I'm one of those guys who likes to read deeper. So the Ledger Insights continues with this digital identity. MasterCard is now joining something called the Trust Over IP Foundation. I never heard of it before doing this video. Evernim, IBM, 
Well, R3 I'm familiar with because I met a couple guys in Taipei that were from Singapore that were coming up. It's a private blockchain and it's meant just for this. No public eyes. They're going to run everything on private blockchain that's involved in this whole track and trace. So Trust Over IP has its own individual website with all the members. So I put all that below in the description box too. This list here is tiny, tiny what you're seeing in comparison to all the others that are involved in this overlap between the Universal Register and the COVID Trust IP with all the initiatives. So you start seeing the same names again and again, and it was really baffling and almost disturbing. Every website I went to had the same main characters as the main funding entities for all of this. Like I said in the beginning, it seems as if they've all come together. They have idea A and they create a new company for idea A. Okay, that's the app. And then they come and they say, well, idea B is going to be the barcode that goes on the app. And then they start a whole new initiative and a whole set of protocols and companies just for the barcode application. And then they'll come up in the initiative, see, oh, well, we got to have the QR code with that. And that's a whole entirely different company just to get the QR code just for the COVID track and trace. But it's all the same companies. It's almost like they're piecemealing out each individual thing, making their own initiatives for it. And when I say it goes deep, I want you to understand truly how deep it goes. This is off the Trust IP website, and this is just a spackling of the companies involved in this. That list, you can scroll down, scroll, 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 and it keeps going in the companies involved in this. And since we're talking about R3 and the whole Singapore blockchain landscape, these are the companies just in Singapore involved in all these protocols that are moving forward globally. So if it's like this just in Singapore, what's it like in the United States? What's it like in Europe from all these bigger companies that are intertwining with all this? It's a global ID program, pure and simple. There's no way around it. Now, one of the key players here, Evernim, are the ones who put forth this great idea of sovereign self-identity. You can get the COVID-19 test status credentials. Thank you very much. You can get healthcare professional credentials. Incredible, because then they can cross-pollinate. And if you're the healthcare professional, you're allowed to look me up and check out my status credentials. Remote learning, teaching, whatnot, and remote employment. See, this is where they get you in this double pincer. They're going to be the ones also in charge of clearing you health-wise for your employer to allow you to enter the offices. So see, now we're getting into this Rubik's Cube here of who controls who, Enter the self-sovereign identity, Evernim again. Oh, imagine that. Decentralized identity, blockchain identity, portable digital identity, meaning you don't go anywhere without this thing, without your test results. And here's the thing where they start splicing language together here. Decentralized semantics. And it's about an interoperable overlay on the deployment of all these technologies, meaning that if I have the QR code, it has to sync and work with the app development on all the protocols across all these companies and all the initiatives. So the overlay is the only thing stopping this right now. Give it about six months and they will have worked out the overlay. I think they probably have already, but it's just in testing right now. Because it's about now integrating all these Linux Foundation templates so they can get a request. And when they get that digital request, then the utility and service providers can then integrate and, and send back the answers or information, whatever it is they're looking for. And then within the semantic standard itself, one's not good enough. So see, they're setting up different semantic standards here. So then you have the interchangeability standards, which is a little bit different from the interoperability standards and the way that it's business to business, business to government. And on this level, it's not for you or I, it's for governments to track and see you. You're in the layer of the overlap. You're just stuck in the mud there. But this one taking it on is how governments, business, and corporations are going to operate within. So this trust over IP technology, see, this is the interface that's a little stuck right now. But once this gets unglued and everything works flawlessly, you're going to be plugged into this thing. They call it a trust ecosystem where all these trusted partners, as we've been seeing through the video here, are all linked to each other, not only themselves, but they're also linked to government. So government can check your ID, your passport against what they have given you as an ID. So make sure that your passport, your face, your fingerprints, if they're on file somewhere, match up with what the digital identity that the corporations gave to you, not the government. And then you get all these layered facets here with the credentials governance, the provider governance, utility governance, and the ecosystem itself. This is why they need an individual company for each facet of this. So what we're looking at here is probably at least nine different organizations have set up as if they're their own thing that's working by itself. 
but it's not. They're all working toward this in the integration of the wallets and the utility. And if you dive into the white paper and then you actually go over to GitHub and then you can see the full layout of the interoperability governance frameworks, which I know is boring for a few people, but what it means for you is the way they're putting in this thing called a verifiable organization network, which gives carte blanche to any of these organizations that are involved in this. There'll be no culpability, no questioning from any government as long as they're in the VON network. Because these corporations are setting themselves up outside of the government to be their own identity network. If you're not in it, you're not able to buy, sell, or trade. Way beyond the government at this point. And the one you really want to focus on there is the DIACC on the third line. The Digital Identity and Authentication Council of Canada. Because Canada is only one out of 40, 50 countries. So just change the name. Digital Identity and Authentication Council of United States. Digital Identity and Authentication Council of the EU. And then Digital Identity and Authentication of Croatia. And just go and go and go. I didn't see much in South America yet, but Brazil's on there. Uruguay's not. And what gets to the spookiest part of all of this is the ownership of you as a human on this planet by the corporations that are then going to oversee you as a guardian just like a parent can oversee a child as a guardian, the corporations are taking delivery of you, your resource, your body, and they're going to oversee it as a guardian agent. Now, they're going to call it digital guardianship, and it's going to be put in the cloud. They're going to call it a cloud agent or a cloud wallet service where, highlighted in blue, an individual or organization willing to take the legal responsibility for managing that cloud agent wallet slash FedCoin deposited for your stimulus on behalf of the person under guardianship called the dependent. That's you and me. So when we take a look back here, it should be almost inverted where the verifier and issuer are the corporations making their own laws to make sure that they can own you and you're just at the bottom. No saying what goes on, really. You can say no, but I think this is going to be the division of humanity here. You say no, you go grow your own food, you provide your own electricity, medicine, water, and you get out of the system, or you stay in and you continue. Now, for me, I like reading white papers. That's one of my things because I really like cryptocurrency, and I really believe in the technology moving forward as a decentralized application that can get us out of a lot of this. But now it's being used to rope us back in and put chains around us even further. But go into the distributed ledger identification systems in the humanitarian sector. Now, that is more about NGOs operating in different countries that will put digital identity to verify different projects, people, people involved in the projects, different countries, corrupt countries that there's a single individual that can take delivery of the money. But it goes so much deeper into the whole making sure everybody has their chips. Now the white paper is put out by Sovereign. So when you take a look at the guardianship section in that white paper, we come back into this self-sovereign identity and it, the way they word it's great it sounds like you're making your own identity as a sovereign individual so you don't have to worry about the governments but no it's about the corporations making the identity for you that you have to use not the government see this is completely different but when we come into this universal registrar it's going to be working to give everybody a digital identity and a decentralized identifier system they're called DIDs. You're going to start to see this wording as well, these decentralized identifiers. Just think of it as an individual barcode for you, not tattooed on your skin yet. And again, go up to GitHub. You can check out anybody's project that has something with either decentralized finance, blockchain, and there's so many others out there too. Patents and anything digital in that whole space of storage, integration, computing, or whatever it is. GitHub is the place to go to find this. I tracked down the Identity Foundation Decentralized Identity. So all the information is here, and I'm just chasing down leads as I find them. But the scariest thing for me that maybe dropped my jaw here for a second was the Identity for All Council. Now, this sounds something straight out of whatever dystopian movie you can name through history or even some of these off-world space movies, you know, Star Trek and whatever it would be. The I-4A. Sounds so kind and gentle. Identity for All so when you see such innocent language as MasterCard joins the ID2020 initiative exploring decentralized digital identities, that's exactly what they're doing to own you. 
and not just you, individuals. It'll be about organizations, governments, companies, natural things, man-made things. Anything ever made, anything ever grown, natural or synthetic, will be in this system digitized. And when you have to buy your food by the calorie moving forward, which is part of this plan, you will have to understand cloud wallets. You will have to understand blockchain. And you'll quickly come to the realization that without any of that, you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade anything as a human being on this planet. The tentacles are around you. And you might say, well, I will never do that. But the Australian politicians are already a step ahead of you in passing laws down there that says you will be deprived of participation in everyday life if you do not do this. We cannot afford morally or economically to give even a fifth of an eighth of an inch of ground to those who choose not to get into this whole COVID digital identity. And even if new facts come out, this particular politician here says, I am not interested in your alternative facts. Facts mean nothing as we tumble down the rabbit hole and will not listen to facts. And as I referenced in my previous video, Michigan is going to be allowing employers to chip their employees. And this is where it dovetails into all of the previous that's on apps and phones and in the cloud storage. Now they're going to try to integrate this, all your medical records, all your digital identity, your self-sovereign identity, and your barcoded number in the system. Right now, they even say that they can't mandate that employees take this. But in the very next paragraph, they say, I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes a standard business practice statewide. Scratch that globally. If you want to eat or access society, anything that you're used to as a citizen of any country right now as a service, you will need to be in the V-Code system or you will need to leave the society back to a pioneering lifestyle and join an Amish community or form your own. But you're not going to be getting electricity where you live. You'll need a digital ID to pay your bill. Even if you want to pay for somebody else, they'll have to know who you are because they're going to track and trace every single cent spent moving forward with the central bank digital currencies. It's all about you getting into the new system. It's not about health. 